this point, Vicki Mandel King is going to introduce our speaker. Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for coming. You're in for a real treat. It's my pleasure to be able to welcome Elizabeth here, coming back home. She grew up here. She has a wonderful family. Uh, her mother and father, I count as very close friends who have had a meaningful role in my life as well. Elizabeth is here today to talk about her relationship with Stephen, who died young of cystic fibrosis, and the journey she took with him, the lessons she learned, <coughs> what she may be able to help all of us with in terms of dying well in a hospital, but more so, in her words, Stephen's legacy about how dying or thinking about death itself helps us to know better how to live. Elizabeth has written a book called My Foreign Cities about this. A friend of mine said when I re recommended the book, is this about travel? And I said, it's my understanding that, like many young people, Elizabeth thought that she'd fall in love, there'd be happily ever after, and there'd be travel in her life and adventure. And uh, this book is not so much about cities and places on a map, but I would say it's about places in the heart, and it's about a journey that she and Stephen took together that um, is a journey that, like that'll have many paths that all of us will end up taking. The book is at the back table for sale and along consistent with all of Elizabeth's values, um, what she learned from her parents and from this experience and just who she came into the world as, she is donating all the proceeds of purchase of these books to Compassion and Choices. So if you want to purchase a book, Sonia will be at the table there to take uh, $15 that will go to That's Compassion and Choices. My card. So um, with that, Elizabeth, please come up here and everyone give her a really warm welcome. She's a delight. Thank you so much for having me here today. Um, it's a real pleasure to be back in my hometown, and uh, thanks so much to Vicki and Ray and the Board of the Compassion and Choices for inviting me and for all of you, and it's lovely to see my family and Stephen's family and friends and everyone here on a Saturday morning. I'm moved that you're willing to be here on this beautiful day um, talking about death, and <laughs> I, I really appreciate that. I admire you for that. Um, you know, when Vicki invited me to speak, I tried to think what I would have to offer. Um, I don't have any medical or legal es expertise. Um, I do have my own personal experience with someone who faced mortality, his mortality at a young age, who I love dearly. And I also have experience um, going through his death with him. Um, he died, and I, and I thought that that might be helpful in a way because he died in a hospital. Um, and I kind of call it the good enough death because, of course, he would have preferred to die what we would all like to do is the good death, you know, at home, hopefully in our sleep. <laughs> but if not that, you know, surrounded by loved ones, maybe with hospice. Um, and that wasn't possible for him. So he faced the question, you know, how do I die as well as possible in the hospital? And his family and I faced that question with him. So I just wanted to speak today about, um, you know, what I learned from him and what I learned from navigating death in the face of modern medicine, which we are all in the face of modern medicine, yes. <laughs> are we? <laughs> um, so Stephen had cystic fibrosis, <clears throat> which the, the shorthand is that it's a disease that um, causes deterioration of the lungs. And at this point, most people, uh, the average life expectancy is around 37. Um, when we were growing up, it was much younger. It's, it's increased over time. Um, 
but he was really healthy as a young kid and even into his late teenage years. I met him when he was 17 and he was, you know, much more, he rock climbed and played football and soccer and everything, um, much more so than I did, but he did know his prognosis. Um, and I really wish he could be here to give this talk. I wish he could have given talks like this because he could fill 10 talks um, and he'd be a lot funnier <laughs> than I am. And you'd leave you know, laughing, a little bit disturbed by his sense of humor, but um, <laughs> also you know, laughing and appreciating your lungs and your life and your family. And uh, I just wish I could give you that. Um, but I can't, and I'll give you what I can give you and hope that he would be okay with that. Um, one thing that I, in my experience with him and with some other people, it seems like there's a big difference between someone who's had a life-threatening illness their entire life and someone who is has one after years of being healthy. Um, I feel like for Stephen, you know, he wasn't waiting for the other shoe to drop. The shoe had dropped and he was just doing what he could with what he had. Um, and he faced that situation, I think, the way he faced everything in life, which was very bluntly um, and with a sense of humor and just, he was very upfront about it. Um, I was remembering recently that we went to our 10th year high school reunion. And if you don't remember your 10th year high school reunion, it's really not that worth it. You know, it's like everybody's still really proud of themselves and you know, needing to compete and all that. Uh, and Stephen just kept walking up to people and flashing his transplant scar. He had a double lung transplant. And, um, and it was great. I mean, it changed the entire tenor of the 10th grade high school reunion. Um, some people were bothered, but most people really laughed and sort of appreciated it and kind of brought us all down to earth. Um, and another really small example of that is I was remembering my sister Catherine telling me that um, there was a time when Stephen had to go in the hospital for something and it was, you know, she was worried about him and she thought, oh, I don't know what to say. Um, he answered the phone and she said, oh, I'm, I'm really sorry that you have to go in the hospital. And he said, you know, I just hope I get a single. And then he proceeded to tell her all about his last experience with a roommate, which involved lots of TV and a roommate walking around without underwear under his gown and, you know, this whole story. And um, it just, it was great, you know. Um, I, um, it's interesting because I always thought that that was just Stephen. Um, but recently after writing this book, he and I never really met many people with cystic fibrosis, but after writing this book, Lots of people have gotten in touch with me. And I was at a conference recently with a bunch of people who had CF. And they kept saying to me, oh, you know, Stephen totally had the CF personality. And I was like, what's that? You know, I was a little taken aback. And they said, oh, he was direct, he was blunt, zero small talk, um, kind of absurd sense of humor, and just, you know, demanding that you appreciate life. And uh, I thought, you know, that was very true. And when I looked back, even in my email exchanges with these people from CF, with CF, um, I could see that. You know, this woman in her, she's in her 40s, she's had a double lung transplant, and she wrote me, and you know, it was as, as if we'd known each other for years. You know, her first line was something like, um, I know CFers can be a pain in the ass, so thank you for what I'm sure were some hard times, you know, with your husband, but I also know I'm sure he was worth it. And, uh, and that's not really the way acquaintances in their 40s email each other, you know? Um, but I loved it. I loved it. Um, and on a more sober note, that same person um, told me about when she was younger going to camp with a bunch of people with CF, which Stephen never did because he was very healthy as a child, but she wasn't. And the camp would gather and it'd be maybe 100 kids with CF and they really looked forward to it every year, spending time together. And she said at one of the camps, um, one of the social workers was speaking and she said, raise your hand if you would give up, if you could not have cystic fibrosis, but you'd have to give up what you learned from it. And one person raised their hand. Mm -hmm. And they were kids. Mm -hmm. um, so as much as that's hard for me to understand as a healthy person, I think it's, it's real. Um, wow. Yeah. Um, so, I guess I was going to read you a little bit because, uh, you know, there's, I think for Stephen, there is knowing that you're going to die and then there's knowing, you know, like I know at 45 I'm going to die more so than I did at 17, but not really, you know. Mm -hmm. um, and I think Stephen was kind of close to 
where I am now, more of a close to middle-aged, um, when we were 17. Mm -hmm. And I was much more 17, so I just thought I'd read you a little bit about our different points of view. Um, so this is, sorry, tell me if you can't hear me, or tell me if you can hear me. <laughs> you couldn't tell me if you can hear me. Um, this is when we first met, and we were at Boulder High. Um, and we were friends, um, and he was actually going out with a friend of mine. Uh, <laughs> yes, that's true. Um, I didn't steal him, though. <laughs> um, and we were friends, and we were in class together, and she had told me about his illness, but he hadn't said anything to me. I had decided that if he brought it up, I would say I knew, but otherwise I wouldn't. One day, we walked to the corner store during our class break, and he took out a handful of pills. My heart began racing, but it seemed too pointed to ignore the horse pills that he was downing with his coat. Eve told me about those, I admitted. I figured, he said. He paid for his beef jerky. I bought my cup of coffee, and we headed back across the street towards school. He coughed his signature guttural cough, which I'd somehow assumed was from chewing tobacco. So, so it's true for everyone, I ventured. The dying young part? He nodded. Me and Jim Morrison, but probably not that young. I pictured Jim Morrison near the end of his career, heavy set, bearded, his face no longer chiseled but loose, old, a full adult, so far from where we were now. I was flooded with relief. Still, I wasn't sure what I was supposed to say. I'm sorry? Once, Stephen and I had been talking about a girl in our science class who annoyed him. I thought she deserved a break. I'd heard she lived in a group home. Stephen gave me a dirty look when I brought this up. Do you think she wants you to feel sorry for her? He'd spat. If she's irritating, she's irritating like anybody else. <laughs> Suddenly, he was on her side, his dislike of her a show of solidarity. <laughs> this was the light that he'd want to be seen in. So I tried to see him that way, like his circumstances were just circumstances nothing to shrink from. I went ahead and asked, how long will you live, do you think? He thought about it for a second. At least till I'm 30. I could make it to 40, but I'm not sure. Do you think about it a lot? It's a long way off, and you never know what'll happen. I could spend all this time worrying about it and end up getting hit by a bus. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> so that was Stephen at 17, and me at 17. And wow. we went out, um, and then we broke up, and then, um, we both went to college in separate states, and finally somewhere in college we admitted that we were really in love with each other. And after college I moved from Chicago out to California to be with him. And three weeks after we moved in together, his lung collapsed, um, and he had to go in the hospital at UCSF. And I remember that hospitalization so clearly because of how differently we felt about it. Um, I was terrified, and he was very nonchalant. And I sort of didn't know, like, what do you do when someone goes into the hospital? So I remember his first night in there, I was sitting with him in his room, and I had just gotten this job as a, like a secretary for a, a small press. And I said, well, should I, um, should, is this better? I said, should I take time off? You know, maybe I should take the week off work. And he looked at me like I was completely crazy, and he said, well, why would you do that? And I said, well, so I could be in here with you. And he said, well, I don't want to be in here. You know, you can be out there. <laughs> if I could be out there, I'd be out there. Just go out there. <laughs> He's like, and come see me when you want to see me. <laughs> like, really? <laughs> and he said, yeah, if you're going to take time off work, just, you know, do it for something fun. <laughs> so <laughs> then wow. it's really hard to worry about someone who's not worrying. You know, so it makes you feel kind of silly. So uh, I think his family, we all went through this with him. You know, we'd all worry, and then he'd just tell us, stop worrying. Um, wow. So... <clears throat> Little by little, you know, I adopted the way he felt because I think we all do that, you know, the attitude radiates outward from the person and you all feel how they feel about it. Um, and I think in his mid-20s, he had to go in the hospital a fair amount, but he was also quite active and sort of normal um, in the way I felt like we were, or at least he was living his 20s and his 80s at the same time, because um, he was very much um, identified with his illness in the way that he wanted his time to be well spent and he he was you know he wouldn't stand for anyone he didn't want to be around anything he didn't want to be doing and he had all kinds of things he did want to be doing um how much of that is him and how much is it the illness we'll never know i mean he was 
a very urgent person. You know, he loved the Broncos and he hated George Bush. And I mean, you know, it was hard to be with him during a Broncos game. In fact, I could not be in the house um, when they were playing because he was so involved. Um, so that was, you know, part of who he was. But he also, I think, felt like he wanted. Um, he did think of it as, okay, my time is my time is short. Um, and I remember thinking, you know, it was so strange. We'd go from like hanging out on the beach with our friends and go back and he'd do IV antibiotics. And we were really straddling those two, two worlds. Um, but we were also in really different places. I mean, when I say we, you know, he was in one place and I was in the other because I was young and I had the health of a young person. Um, a good example is that I didn't bother to get health insurance, which drove him insane. I mean, now I feel really bad about it. But um, he was like, I can't believe you can see me and not get health insurance. And I was like, I don't have CF, you know, I'm 24, I don't have money for that. Um, that was a mistake. Uh, so I thought I'd read you a little bit more about um, just the different places we stood. And this is, we had decided to get married. Um, I had actually, I was one of these people at 15, I said, I'm never ever getting married or having children. I've now been married twice, so I don't think maybe you should say those things. Um, but, uh, but I had to admit, you know, I really, we were already married. We were in love with each other. We've been living together for a long time. So at 25, we decided that we would get married. Um, and this is us planning our wedding, but it also shows um, sort of how we both were dealing with his mortality at that time. Sorry, I'm not really used to a mic, so. I'm doing good. Yeah, okay. You are doing well. Mic's up too high. Is it too high? Is that better? better. Lower? That's okay. better. Okay, thank you for telling me. Um, we asked our friend Amani to marry us. Stephen found an application in the Universal Life Church Ministry in the back of a magazine. And Amani sent in his ten letter, $10 and letter of intent. The three of us huddled around the kitchen table, mapping out configurations of people on a stenograph pad, leaping through books for readings. We picked up our pace and began flying through the ceremony until Stephen opened the book that held his favorite poem. At least I've got my reading, he said. It was a poem by Pedro Salinas called I Wonder Love. He started to read it out loud. Love is the miraculous delay of its own termination. It is prolonging the magical fact that one and one are two in the face of the original sentence of life. I sank deep into my chair. The original sentence of life at our wedding? In our house, death came up as often as love did, casually, seriously, philosophically, as the subject of a joke, as the subject of a fight. Maybe Stephen had gotten so used to talking about it, he'd lost track of how it sounded to other people. It'll be too weird, I told him. Stephen looked up from his book. My favorite poem is weird. <laughs> Amani got that weary referee look on his face. <laughs> oh, you know I like the poem, I said, but for the wedding? You're the one who didn't want to get married, and now the whole thing is going to be predictable and boring. You already vetoed my skin-tight powder blue tux. <laughs> well, you vetoed tattooed rings. That was your all-time worst idea ever. <laughs> Don't you think talking about love as a long, clear farewell might upset people? You care too much what other people think, um. Stephen said, which was a low blow since it was true. <laughs> Though it was less what they'd think than how they'd feel. There were the people who loved Stephen, the people who loved us both, and the people who loved me. It was the last category that kept appearing in my head, my grandparents and my aunts and uncles. I read the poem again as it lay on the kitchen table. The most certain thing is goodbye, I said. That's just one line. It's the last line. Stephen studied me with a kind of non-judgmental distance. It was as if he thought we were in this together and now could see me for what I was, a person without a short life, a person on the other side of the fence, a person he was going to leave behind. Never mind, he said. I guess I'll just have to write something. This wasn't the most relaxing thought either. <laughs> we, we picked up our pace until we slammed up against the vows. If Stephen was too willing to invite death up on stage, I was maybe too eager to ban it completely. I announced that I was not going to say until death do you part. When most people said they'd be together until death, they were making an expansive, overwhelming promise. It felt like we should get to have something expansive too. I suggested that we say forever, which does seem silly in retrospect, but which felt like a triumph at the time. 
Stephen was purely skeptical. For one thing, it's unrealistic, he said. <laughs> After all these years of promoting marriage, of being sure that we could last a lifetime, of taking that leap of faith without much thought, he was turning practical. You can love someone after they die, I argued. You can love someone, Stephen said, but you can't still be married. It would take years for me to understand the future that he was making room for. You know, I think um, it was so hard for me to understand. When I look back, there's so much of his perspective that I didn't understand. And after losing him, I think I understand more of it. But there's still so much I feel like I don't get. Um, and he was so alive and here, much more so than lots of people who are here, um, that it was really hard to believe and hard to put your mind around the fact that that wouldn't be true at some point. Um, and I think that was true for many people who loved him. Um, you know, so Stephen didn't have the people he loved maybe who understood, but he was very lucky because he did have a doctor who was willing and um, able to understand his position. And I think if, you know, when I think about my whole experience, I think if I could bottle one thing from that time and give it to everyone who had a serious illness, it might be Dr. Stuhlbarg. Um, he was Stephen's CF doctor from the time Stephen was 20 until Stephen died at 30. And he was just a very blunt person as well, very engaging person. And he, you know, he was in a field where all of his patients died young, so it's somewhat if you're gonna go into a field where there's an illness that doesn't have a cure, you probably have maybe a different perspective on death than other people do. Um, but he was always willing to have those conversations. Um, I remember he did things like, you know, when we got married, he wrote happy marriage for us and gave it to us, and then I realized it was a prescription, <laughs> which I really loved, and um, we saved that. Um, and he was always, yeah, it was sweet and forthright, you know. Um, and he was always willing to talk with Stephen about, you know, he'd say, okay, so you don't know how much time you have. What do you want to do? What do you want to do with the time that you have? Um, he gave his medical advice, keeping the, less, the rest of life in, in mind. Um, and so that allowed Stephen to talk with him about things that I don't think he could talk very easily with me about. Um, I mean, we did, but I don't think I was much help. Um, and I remember him going to Dr. Stuhlbarg and saying, you know, I really want to go to graduate school in Boston, but my health isn't great, what do you think? And Dr. Stuhlbarg said, yeah, that's probably going to take some months off your life. You know, how badly do you want to go? And Stephen came home and said, I really want to go. <laughs> you know, and so we went. Um, he also, Dr. Stuhlbarg, really looked out after me. When we got to Boston, Stephen th went through a period where he experienced a depression, and they were always emailing, the two of them. And he emailed Dr. Stuhlbarg about this, and he responded, and then at the bottom of the email, he wrote, um, depression can be hard on the partner. How's Liz doing? And you know that opened up a whole conversation for us, because it's hard to bring that up with your partner. Um, and I think the biggest gift he really gave me um, was in Stephen's final days. Um, so when we went to Boston, Stephen went to graduate school, and his health, unfortunately, started to take a really sharp decline, um, and he's having trouble breathing during the day, he had to wear oxygen at night, and he was in the hospital more and more. And finally his doctor said, you know, I think it's time for you to consider getting on the transplant list. Um, and for people with cystic fibrosis, a double lung transplant is both this great hope and this um, last ditch effort, really. It's both those things because it's very risky. Um, but if it does work, you have the chance for the first time in your life of living a normal life because each organ generates its own cells, so you'll never have cystic fibrosis in your lungs again. But you're working with no immune system so that you can not reject the new lungs. So you have to be careful about every cold and you know everything. So it's, it's a trade-off, um, but one that Stephen wanted to make. Um, and it was a very exciting time to just think about the possibility of shedding all of these medical burdens that he had. Um, so he got on the transplant list. We moved back to California where we were going to do the transplant. And we thought we'd have about a year before we got the call, the page it was supposed to be. Um, and it happened in a month um, and weeks, maybe. And there was not even time to get a pager. We just got a call in the middle of the night. Uh, we were up, luckily, because we were 27. Um, <laughs> we're just like hanging out. Um, so you know, we got in the car, and we went. And it was um, really exciting, really terrifying time. His whole family came. Um, 
and he got the transplant and he did well um, and he had close to two years um, living with the transplant and you know it was complicated it's, it's never simple I mean he had the medications were pretty crazy and and had all kinds of side effects but he did overall get this experience of being healthy for the first time since he was you know first time in maybe seven years um, and he biked and he just did all kinds of stuff he went to Mexico we were probably not supposed to do that um, but he did lots of stuff that he wanted to do um, and then one night he got a high fever and in the trans you know it's a sign of infection and it's really not good to get an infection when you have a transplant but you, they can often adjust your medications but we went to the hospital and the next day um, he was put on a ventilator and there was something just ravaging his lungs and they didn't know what it was and they were trying to figure it out and um, his whole family came my family came lots of friends were around and he was in the ICU for about three weeks um, and it was really scary but um, it was also, you know, he had survived and thrived this scary, life-threatening operation, 